Hey everyone, Morgan here. So we're going into a new chapter now, and it is where we actually start to talk about chemistry. So it's going to be a lot more interesting, uh, not just for all of you folks, but also for me to be talking about. And this is the chapter where we introduce a lot of our basic concepts that we'll be looking at for the entire year. And we uh, start that out today by talking about matter and change, okay? So we're in a new lecture outline. We're on the first page of it, and we're gonna talk about some difference between chemical and physical changes, but we need to understand the concept of the word matter. And it's probably the simplest word in all of chemistry to define. It's anything that has mass and takes up space. And that's a definition that you would have heard back in your uh, elementary school science classes and your middle school science classes, but we tend to simplify it a bit and just refer to stuff, okay? And that just means anything, okay? You can see it, smell it, touch it, hear it. You can just detect it in any way. Anything is matter. Now, you were probably told that there are three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. And that's a pretty accurate description even for this class. But just in case, let's take it a little bit farther and understand that there are two other states of matter that do exist. Plasmas. Plasmas are basically charged gases, okay? The only plasma you're probably familiar with is our sun, okay? And then a theoretical construct that was just verified in the laboratory within the last 20 years called a Bose-Einstein condensate and well beyond uh, this course. So we're not uh, really gonna ask any questions about that. So for us, we'll go with just solid, liquid, and gas as our three states of matter. So everything is matter. We just need to understand that, okay? Now, the air that's around you, you can't see it, but it's made up of stuff. Now, mostly that's nitrogen gas and it's oxygen gas. But there are a couple other gases you know, that are thrown in there. Actually, it's, it's quite a few other gases. Uh, the most predominant one is argon, but there's very little even of it in there uh, in the grand scheme of things, okay? So there's a demonstration that typically I'd be doing in the classroom, uh, actually involving a funnel, but I'm gonna show you a slightly different version in here that I found on YouTube that I thought you might actually like to be able to recreate at home. Take a really big bowl of water and you're gonna take a, a cup of some type and it doesn't have to be see-through or anything. And the people who did this one actually balled up a piece of paper and uh, stuck it to the bottom of the cup with a little bit of glue. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna invert that cup, which is full of air, believe it or not, and they're gonna stick it down into the bowl of water. Now you'll notice that the water rises the water level inside that bowl does go up. It can't go into the cup because the cup is full of air. There's stuff that's in there. Now, when they bring it back out, take a look inside, the paper's dry, okay? The water couldn't get to the paper because the air was preventing it from doing that. Now, I typically do that with a funnel, no paper, just the funnel and I hold my finger over the end of the funnel and I let go when it's in uh, a bowl of water. And you can see that as the air escapes from the funnel, the water will run back into it, okay? So that's something you can actually try at home. Now, physical changes. Physical changes are pretty simple uh, to understand. No new matter is created in a physical change. Typically what we like to say is that physical changes are pretty easily reversed. And we talk about these mostly in terms of changes of state or phase changes. And you're probably pretty familiar with most of these words, okay? There are six phase changes between the solid, the liquid, and the gas phases. So you have solid, you've got liquid, you've got gas. And solid turns into a liquid, what do we call that? That's melting. When a liquid 
goes to a gas, we call that boiling. Boiling is one of the most mis -word, misused words out there. Boiling does not mean hot. Boiling means a liquid turning into a gas, okay? Let's avoid the word evaporation. We'll introduce that word next term, okay? Uh, it has some very specific definitions that we have to pay attention to. Now we can reverse these. A gas can turn into a liquid. We call that condensation. Now condensation can be both a noun and a verb. That water that you find on the hood of a car on a cold morning is condensation. That's the noun. But the process of that water forming out of water vapor that's in the air is the verb condensation. Now the liquid that turns into the solid is called freezing, also a very misused term. <laughs> freezing does not mean cold. Freezing means a liquid turning into a solid. And that can happen in a lot of different temperature ranges depending upon what the substance is that we're talking about, okay? Now, I might be having a small problem with counting your thinking, you're seeing four phase changes. What do we still have? Well, a solid can go all the way to a gas, and we call that sublimation. And then a gas can go all the way to a solid, and we call that deposition, okay? Now, give you a second to get these all figured out. If necessary, you can always pause this video at any time, finish working on your outline, and then restart it when you're ready to go again. Okay. Now, what really changes during the phase change? Well, this is something that I am very particular about, uh, and I want you to get it right. I don't want you to... Uh, learn one thing that is incorrect just for the sake of simplicity, okay? What we're going to be talking about here is molecular motion. So what's changing during a phase change will be the speed at which particles are moving and the distances between the particles. In a solid, particles tend to be quite close together. They are vibrating. They're still in motion, but the particles are basically locked in position. Think about a bunch of kids in a classroom or a movie theater or a sporting event. They're all in seats, okay, but they're not sitting still. Now, in the liquid phase, that would be a whole bunch of kids in a classroom. They're just kind of slowly walking around the room and doing things. But for the gas phase, You'd be bouncing off the walls, bouncing off the ceiling, bouncing off the floor, flying around all over the place, moving really fast. Okay? So, as the temperature increases, the particles start moving faster, and eventually they get enough energy to overcome any inner particle forces that are acting upon them. And as they get farther and farther apart, these phase changes happen. So what we're really talking about here is molecular motion. Now, what's not changing? What the particles are. Water that's in the solid phase might be called ice, but it's still water. And when it melts, it's water. And when it boils, it's water. It has not changed chemically. It's just that the particles are farther apart and that they're moving faster. And that's a really important thing to understand. Okay, so here we're looking at water, water, and water undergoing phase changes. On the left, you're seeing water that's boiling. Upper right, water that's melting. Lower right, water that is condensed on the outside of some glass. And in all three cases, it's H2O. It's water. That's what you're seeing. Okay, now, this is a really cool demonstration that we do. Uh, I don't have any video of it in my classroom, 
So I'm actually just going to show you some that I pulled off of uh, YouTube of it. But this is just a really great demonstration where you see iodine subliming and then deposition. Okay. It's just a little clip of some iodine crystals to begin with. Okay. Let's start off now with iodine as a solid, kind of a black or blue pellet like substance. We're going to put it into a hot plate, warm it on up. It doesn't have to be a really high temperature. And you get this great purple cloud. Okay. Really cool looking. Okay. Used in special effects sometimes. Okay. Now, that was sublimation. It skipped the liquid phase. That flask has ice cubes in it, just so that it's cold. Put that at the top of the beaker. So the vapor, the gas that's in there, that's iodine vapor, is now going to cool off and it's going to turn in to the solid. It's not going to liquefy. It's going to go straight from the gas to the solid. That's deposition. Okay, not condensation. Deposition. And then those are those really cool iodine crystals that you were seeing back at the very beginning. Okay. Now, it's nowhere near as cool to watch this on video as it is to do it in the classroom. Okay. But at least it gives you an idea about what sublimation and deposition look like. You might be a little more familiar with, de oh, sorry, with sublimation just from seeing dry ice. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to chemical change. Now chemical change is different. It produces new matter. You get new stuff, something that's different than what you started with. Okay. It's a change that cannot be easily reversed. Okay. Now we used to say that it can't be reversed and it's mostly true. There are some exceptions to that. So we say, you know, can't easily be reversed. But for just about anything we talk about in this class, it can't be reversed. Okay. Now, this is another demonstration that we would have been doing uh, in the room, usually in a fume hood because it smells pretty bad. Okay. Crank this up. That funny sound you're hearing is a vent that's running. This is being done in a fume hood. It's like the vent above the stove in your house. Okay. Or you might have a vent like this in your bathroom on some exhaust fan. So that's pure sugar, just table sugar. Now what's been poured on it is battery acid, concentrated sulfuric acid. And what it's doing is taking out the water that's actually in the carbohydrate that's in the sugar itself. It's dehydrating the sugar. And you can see that kind of coming off as the cloud right now. It releases a lot of energy, that water boiling away. And what it's leaving behind is pure carbon. That is not smoke. That's water vapor. It's leaving it. Essentially, that giant black thing is a piece of charcoal, like you might put in a barbecue. Okay, so you're not going to be able to reverse that. You can't pour some water onto that and get the sugar back. That's been destroyed. Okay, that is chemical change. You have made new stuff. And the smell of that is just absolutely terrible, which is why we always do it inside of a fume hood. Okay, now. We're going to go to the next page of your outline. I'll give you a second to turn page over. And we are going to follow a little flow chart here that I've outlined on the page. This is a flow chart of matter, so to speak. 
So in our upper left box, we're going to put elements. And you're probably familiar with elements like hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And elements are represented by symbols. Symbols like the letters H and O and C. Those are capitalized. Now, elements can combine to form compounds. Compounds like water and salt and carbon dioxide, which you're probably all familiar with. And those compounds are represented by chemical formulas. And those symbols that represented the elements are used to write those chemical formulas like H2O and NaCl and CO2. Now, compounds take part in chemical change, you know, kind of like the formation of water. And that can be represented by what we call a chemical equation. And chemical formulas are what appear in those chemical equations. Now, this flowchart is great. This actually is the first two chapters, the first two units of this class, okay? And there's just an amazing amount of material in here. And it gives us a lot of vocabulary that we need to pick up. And we're gonna spend time in this chapter learning what some of these words are, learning how to write these formulas, learning how to name these compounds. Then in our next unit, we're gonna learn how to write these chemical equations, how to balance them, what they mean, what the special symbols are that appear in them, things along those lines. Leave that up for a couple seconds for you. As always, you can pause if necessary. If you're in the room, I'd be passing around a lot of jars right now that would have, you know, different samples of this in them so that you could look at them. But for today's purposes, I've listed things that I think you're already pretty familiar with. Okay. Now, flipping over the next page, it's time for some definitions. And let's be honest, this is not the most exciting thing that we're going to do the entire year but it is necessary, okay? Because you've been using words incorrectly, probably, okay? And I'm not gonna have a lot of faith that your uh, eighth grade science teachers gave you the correct definitions for these words. So I wanna run through them. Now, uh, this is not something I'm gonna make you go through very often, okay? I'm not real big into memorization, okay? And I'm not, really big into making you learn a lot of vocabulary, but we have to lay the groundwork, so to speak, for what we're gonna be doing, okay, for the rest of the year. So, you know, be patient with us today, all right? And then it'll be uh, quite different uh, for quite a long time. <laughs> okay, now, for each of these words, uh, I've included some graphics, and you don't need to draw the graphics or understand anything special about them. I'll just point out why I picked them, okay? Uh, element, what's an element? A substance that cannot be separated into simpler components by chemical means. Now, often people will define the word element just by pointing at a periodic table. Okay, and this periodic table uh, I'm very fond of. Every element shown here is actually represented by a postage stamp. And the element is portrayed in one way or another on those postage stamps. And this table itself was created uh, by a friend of mine uh, in upstate New York at St. Lawrence University. And he uh, did this at, in a hallway uh, in, in his chemistry department, uh, and it got a lot of attention, was turned into a poster, uh, and you know, distributed you know, for a few places around the country. Just, just kind of a cool one, just as you know, a listing of elements. 
Okay. Now an atom. An atom is the smallest part of an element that has the chemical properties of that element. And this is a terrible graphic for defining an atom because it's just really not correct, but it's what you've always been shown. This is not the way electrons really behave, okay? This is not really the way that protons and neutrons behave. Uh, it's very difficult for us to draw pictures of how electrons behave, okay? But it's what has been popularized over about the last 75 years, um, actually coming up on about 100 years now, okay? Uh, and it's just, a, it's a common diagram, but it's not correct. And I thought it would be valuable to show it to you, to tell you it's not right. Okay. And these, you know, loops that they show you for electron orbits are just not correct. Sorry, folks. That's not the way electrons really behave. Molecule. A molecule is a collection of two or more atoms. Now they can be the same or they can be different. Okay. And this is actually a decent representation of water. It's not bad. Okay. And again, at any time, feel free to pause the video if you need more time to write. It's not a big deal. Okay. Typically, molecules are bonded together, covalent bonding. Okay. And they are the smallest particle that exists of a compound. And that would specifically be a covalent compound. Ionic compounds will be treated separately. Isotopes, okay? It's a pretty nice diagram, actually, to talk about isotopes. One or more atoms that have the same atomic number, but different numbers of neutrons. So there are three isotopes that exist for hydrogen. One that has no neutrons, which we call hydrogen. One that actually has a neutron, we call it deuterium and one that has two neutrons that we call tritium. Now, sometimes people will refer to hydrogen itself with mass number one as being protium based on it just having a proton. It's not an uncommon name, okay? So isotopes, we'll talk about them a lot later in the year. Compound. I figured you're probably familiar with table salt, okay? So a combination of two or more elements. This sounds a lot like the definition of a molecule, but it's not the same, because now we're talking about two or more elements, not two or more atoms. Now, all compounds would basically be molecules, but not all molecules would be compounds. Ion, an atom that has lost or gained electrons. Now, I'm guessing that in your biology classes, they probably talked about ions being charged particles. And that's correct, except for me, in this class, you need to understand why they have charge, okay? And it's by having an unbalanced number of electrons. This is a pretty good little table here. And since this is, you know, a video that's available to you on demand, you can go and spend some time looking at it and seeing how when you lose an electron, you have more protons than you do electrons. So you've got more positive charge than negative charge, and you are a positive ion. Or if you gain electrons, you have more negative than positive, and you become a negative ion. Okay. A cation. Now, some teacher that I knew <laughs> used to teach in the South Bay on Redondo Beach uh, used to play a game with her students and pronounce this as cation. And that, that is not right. It is cation. Okay. That's a positive ion. Okay. 
Positive ions are ions that have lost an electron or more. Okay. You can lose two and become a two plus. You can lose three electrons, become a three plus, et cetera, et cetera. It's a stupid graphic, but you know, I thought there was some humor to it. Anions, negative ions. Okay. Now you've picked up an electron. You now have negative charge. Now this graphic, and I'm not expecting you, you know, to copy these down if you don't want to, but this graphic actually does tell you a pretty good description of cations and anions. It talks about the why, okay? More electrons than protons, you're gonna have a negative charge. Fewer electrons than protons, you're gonna have a positive charge. Monoatomic. I just loved this image, okay? Monoatomic gold. Well, <laughs> that bottle has to be from like the 1930s, okay? So using your language skills, mono, one, atomic atom. That's just what it means. Monoatomic means you have something that's made up of one atom. Diatomic means it's made up of two atoms. Okay, now there are some elements that when they are alone in nature, they exist as diatomic molecules. Okay, and these are the ones that are commonly diatomic in nature. And we have a silly little memory device, an acronym that we use, Hofbrinkel. Okay, which represents these elements. This is not a real word. This is made up. Okay, but it's something that does help us remember which of these elements. And there are more than just these. It's just that these are the ones that we commonly use. You'll notice that some of these are singly bonded, some are double bonded, some are triple bonded. And we'll end up dealing with all of that later in the year. Polyatomic, okay, many atoms. Now, this chart that you're seeing here actually comes from a website, Compound Chem, and the information is there at the bottom of the image. And this is really a great website for you to take a look at. It's a guy named Andy Burning, who's over in the United Kingdom. And he does these graphics all the time. And I think you're just gonna love them. Because, you know, he'll do the chemistry of chocolate or, you know, the chemistry of pumpkin spice. And he'll release these things, you know, around holidays. And he'll talk about, you know, different things that are in the news and put them all together. Just some really cool, you know, communicating science for the general public style things. So look down there at the bottom, compoundchem.com. He's on Twitter at compoundchem. His name's Andy Bruni, just really great guy. Okay, the word organic. Organic means carbon-based compounds. Now this word has been hijacked by high-end grocery stores, okay, to try to sell you vegetables that they've grown in what they call special ways. What they really mean are pesticide-free, okay, and even that's a lie because they say, we don't use pesticides. Instead, we use these other things, which are still pesticides. There's different types of pesticides. <laughs> okay. So organic will be carbon-based compounds. Inorganic will be what we call salts when we have a metal and a non-metal that are bonded together. Now, these can contain carbon. Carbon's not, you know, forbidden. It's just that organic compounds typically won't have metal with non-metal. 
Sodium chloride or table salt is a good example. Now the structure of salts of inorganic compounds is a little bit different. They don't typically exist as single molecules. They typically exist as big three-dimensional arrays, which is shown pretty nicely in this image. Okay, now molecular. Molecular compounds are covalent, okay? They are a molecule, okay? They would be composed of non-metals. Now, I've said two non-metals, but it could also be three, four, five, a hundred. Okay, you, you get the idea, okay? The bonding is going to be covalent. It's not going to be ionic, okay? So when you have things like carbon dioxide, they're molecular, okay? Use your language skills. Molecular compounds are made up of molecules, Now, covalent. Let's do some real searching here about this word. Co is a prefix means shared, like to cohabitate means to share a place, a habitat where you live. Now, valent is coming from valence, meaning outermost. So this means that you are held together by shared outermost electrons. However, Valence also means, according to the dictionary, a length of decorative drapery hung above and outside a window to screen the curtain fittings. And when the wife was putting some drapery in our house and we were out shopping for it, and you know, the guy selling us all this stuff started talking about the valence, my ears perked up real fast because I had no idea that's what, you know the term they used for that stuff. Okay, and I'm thinking, all right, I can use this idea in my lecture, but that outermost piece of drapery up at the top, okay, outermost, like outermost electrons. Ionic. These are salts, like we said, okay? When you have metals and non-metals, which are bonded together, like, you know, sodium and chloride. Okay, use your language skills. You know, it'd have to be ionic bonds holding an ionic solid together. Now, this diagram looks great, but it's not 100% accurate. It kind of looks like there's sticks between the atoms, and in reality, they're a little more adjacent to each other, like that last diagram I showed you a few slides back. And again, if these slides are moving past you a little too fast, don't worry, just pause, copy down what you need to copy, then restart the video. <clears throat> That's the one nice thing about getting all this from YouTube, you get to control how fast it goes. Mixtures. Now this I think is actually an outstanding photo to talk about mixtures. That is a mixture of iron, filings, and sand. Mixture is a material of variable composition that contains two or more substances. But it's important to know that those substances maintain their chemical properties. So there are ways to separate mixtures. And in this case, we did it with a magnet. We pulled the iron filings out of the mixture just by running a magnet over it. This is not uncommon to do as a lab. Now, a solution. You might have an idea about what we're about to talk about. A solution is a solute dissolved in a solvent. Less technically, it is a mixture with a uniform, or we can use the fancy word homogeneous or homogeneous consistency. Things like coffee, tea, and Kool-Aid are solutions. 
But milk, soda, and boba are not solutions because they're not uniform. And any of you who've ever actually been on a farm and had milk straight from a cow, you understand just how not uniform it is. And I would encourage you to go to the refrigerator if there is a carton of milk in there and look at the label right now. You will probably find the word homogenized on it, telling you that it is made into a uniform consistency when you buy it at the grocery store. Soda pop's got bubbles in it. Boba's got lots of different pieces in it, okay? Whereas coffee or tea or Kool-Aid is quite uniform. Now let's talk about this in a little bit more detail, okay? Especially the word solute and solvent. Typically right now what I'd be doing in front of you is making a pot of tea, okay? Now the solute, okay? The solute we can say is what you have less of, okay? It is the substance being dissolved by the solvent. So all those little blue crystals in the bottom of that flask would be the solute. And that water that we're pouring in would be the solvent. But the solvent is what you have more of. It is the dissolving medium, fancy term. Now, in figure A on the left there, you've just got the two separate ones. You've got the solid solute, you've got the water going in. In B, they're together. But in C, it's been mixed and it has become uniform and it's become the solution itself. Okay, now how does this happen? Okay, what does it actually look like down at the particle level? The water molecules will attract the solute particles. And because the water molecules move around randomly, when they attract the solute particles, they will pull them away with them. Now, in the case of something like sodium chloride, which is charged, they pull them apart by attracting the negative chlorides to the positive hydrogens or the positive sodiums to the negative oxygens. Water is what we call a polar solvent. And in fact, I'm guessing the biology book you had last year, chapter two or chapter three was probably called Water, the Universal Solvent, okay? Now, in the case of something that isn't ionic, like sodium chloride, if you're trying to dissolve something like sugar, it's all of the OH groups that are in the sugar that will be attracted to the water molecules. Water is such a great solvent because it is poor. Now, the real phrase here that I used was random molecular motion. You don't know where a water molecule is going to go. It just goes in whatever path it goes in. Okay? It doesn't think about it. It doesn't have a brain. It's just wherever it happens to go. Okay? Now, I would recommend that you actually take some time, back up, pause, and get some decent drawings of these last two diagrams into your lecture outlines. Okay, because the concept behind them is pretty important. Okay, now, concentration. This does not mean think, okay? This doesn't mean think harder, okay? Concentration is a measure of how much of something is present per unit of volume. So when we look at A and B, you've got in A, the same number of spheres as you do in B, except they're closer together in A, they're more concentrated. And in B, 
they are more dilute. We've added more water. Perhaps you've seen frozen orange juice that you buy in a can, and then you add water to it and dilute it. Now, frozen orange juice on the can, it says, from concentrate. Water has been removed to freeze it and then sell it. And we're going to be doing a lot of concentration calculations in a later chapter. Okay, concentration is not very different than density, okay? But we have some different units for it. Okay, so that should take you to the end of all those pages uh, in the lecture outline, okay? Those are finished off. Go back and revisit any of these terms that you need to revisit, okay? And we're going to be doing some really cool activities uh, in class uh, via breakout rooms this week to support all this material. Okay, so this is Morgan, and I am going to be signing off.